Today uh, is going to be our final message in the book of Daniel. Uh, this has been a fun series to go through. I hope you guys have enjoyed it too. Uh, it's incredible, the story of what God has done in the course of this. And I, If you've got your Bible, I want to encourage you to grab it and open it up to Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. We're going to get this that little last blip of chapter 11 and then go to the very brief chapter 13 and work through those today. So if you don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one from the seat in front of you. If you're using that, we're going to be on page 896, so uh, you can thumb open to that. You, we've got it up there on the screen. Just as a reminder, in, in chapter 11, uh, we saw that God is really laying out for the nation of Israel. This angel comes and it visits Daniel and it tells Daniel that he's going to tell him about the events that are going to happen into the coming of the Messiah. And, and he starts to lay that out. And last week we covered virtually the whole history of not only Persia from the time that Daniel's prophecy happens in the third year of King Cyrus, who was uh, one of the most dominant uh, rulers in Persian Empire, who conquers the most land or, or conquers the most terrain and expands their empire the most. And we heard what would happen of the, with the four kings that came after him. We got a brief summary of that. We also got to see several different kings who were going to rule uh, in, in the Greek empire. We heard about Alexander the Great and his rise to power, and then the division of the Greek empire between north and south afterwards, and the Seleucid and Ptolemaic empires that came as a result of that. And, and we got to dive through a lot of that history, and really God has just laid out for Daniel, play by play, these are the biggest things that are going to happen over the next 500 years leading into the time of the Messiah. So if you missed any of that, you can go back under our YouTube channel or our website and check it out and still catch all that. The whole series is available there. Um, but at the close of that passage, we heard this summary of the last days during the Greek Empire. And in that, it was explained to Daniel by the angel that what's going to happen is that the people of Israel are throughout the remainder of the Greek Empire after Antiochus Epiphanes. They're going to try to rise up at different points, uh, but nobody's going to come and help them. They're not going to be successful in gaining their independence at any point um, after all of the, the things that happened in the Maccabean Revolt. That there's going to be righteous people that stand up and still stand for God and that they'll, they'll be tried and tested and endure persecution, but they'll be refined through it and, and ultimately come to God. That there'll be people who are evil, who are going to go and do their own thing and what they're doing isn't going to come to a good end. And that sort of summarizes what happens up to the end of the Greek Empire. Now, as we start our passage today, one of the reasons I waited and saved this for the last message is because this final part of chapter 11 in Daniel is very debated in terms of what we're talking about. And really, I'll, I'll tell you my own personal thoughts on it, but you guys should come to your own conclusions. Um, feel free to do your own research and, and see what you think. I'll tell you, though, the three leading theories about what this section is about. Um, one of the leading theories is that we're talking about Antiochus Epiphanes, again, uh, who heavily persecuted the Jewish people under his Greek rule in the Seleucid Empire. I don't think that's likely because it's, it's odd that we would go from talking about Antiochus to then talking about what happens after Antiochus to then going and talking about Antiochus again. But it's possible. Um, the, the other leading, one of the other leading theories is that at this point, we start talking about the Antichrist and the apocalypse and the end of the world and, and life on earth. And again, that's possible, and, and maybe it even has multiple meanings. I think there's arguments to be made there. But the weird part about that to me is, why did we jump from Antiochus in like the year 160, and leap forward to the apocalypse. It seems like we missed a few things in between that time period, right? Like, like for example, maybe Jesus. Maybe he was part of the story somewhere in there. And so it's weird that Jesus would get skipped over entirely and not be a part of that narrative, especially where we see in previous passages that there seems to be, like chapter 8, there seems to be an argument that, that this fourth beast of the Roman Empire, that the last of the empires listed is going to have 10 different rulers, 10 different kings that are going to be significant uh, in, the, in the coming of Christ and the, the falling of, of uh, Jerusalem and the nation of Israel. So, and then this leads us to the third idea. The third idea, and the one I would suggest to you, at least is my personal belief, is that what we're going to be talking about now is the rise of the Roman Empire. We're going to talk about a new king, and specifically Julius Caesar, and then thinking forward from him to Augustus Caesar. Uh, and their lives. And I think as you'll see in a moment, the events we're going to read, they seem to match up with that pretty well. So again, disagreement among scholars with this. It, you, you can have your own understanding and take it to, to, to mean what you, what you think is best. I'd encourage you not to do it just based on a whim, but study the passage and see what conclusions you come to. You can find a lot of commentaries arguing all three of those viewpoints. Um, the, the third, though, I think is, is perhaps the best. Though certainly you can say that a lot of these things 
are anticipatory of, of what it will ultimately look like. There isn't a debate in terms of, is there going to be an Antichrist, for example, or is there going to be a second coming of Jesus? That definitely happens. Our question here is, is this passage about that? That's the question we're faced with. All right, so let's begin with verses 36 through 39, picking back up where we left off last week. The king will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god and will say unheard of things against the god of gods. He will be successful until the time of wrath is complete, for what has been determined must take place. He will show no regard for the gods of his ancestors or for the one desired by woman, nor will he regard any gods, but he will exalt himself above them all. Instead of them, he will honor a god of fortresses, a god unknown to his ancestors. He will honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He will attack the mightiest fortresses with the help of foreign god and will greatly honor those who acknowledge him. He will make them rulers over many people and will distribute the land at a price. So, this first section is describing largely the religious affiliation of this other king that comes up. Another king is going to rise up, and we see here he's got a lot of power. He'll do as he pleases. So, that, that probably doesn't really describe Antiochus. He's constantly being thumped on by Rome or by the Ptolemaics in the south. And so, but, but for Caesar, when Julius Caesar comes to power, as a reminder, he comes into uh, and, and takes over uh, as the, the head leader and, and usurps the Roman Senate, puts himself in a dictatorial position, uh, which is the first time in history they've had somebody take this and hold it. And then he goes around and starts conquering a bunch of other surrounding nations. And in that time of that, we'll hear about his conquest more in a moment, but in that time, Julius Caesar is also the first leader in Rome to declare himself to be a god and the highest of gods. In fact, he even at the time claims the title Savior of the World. That's kind of interesting that he claims to be the Savior of the world, that he claims to be the God of gods. He's speaking these things against God. And strangely, it's right in the same sort of time frame. This is around 60 AD, um, or uh, 60 BC, I should say, 60 years before Christ. Um, this is around 60 BC, and he's doing all these things, um, and it's right around the time that Jesus is about to come on the scene. So he's, he's making these claims and assertions. Then um, he largely rejects the, the deep-founded praise and worship of the Roman gods or the Greek gods that came before him. He sets the, the gods of his fathers aside. And it says in verse 38, instead of those gods, he'll honor the god of fortresses. And I think here we're talking about Caesar. Instead of focusing on these pagan deities and really buying into all that, he claims that he's a god. And really what's God to him is, how can I build the best military and take people over? Being a militaristic general is all of what his life is about. And that's God to him, is, is doing those things. And so he, he rejects his gods, he rejects Yahweh, and he goes and he lives that way. Um, and it says in the final part of verse 39 there, it says he will make them rulers over many people and distribute the land at a price. So these are people who acknowledge him, people who, who praise him. He'll go through and actually allow them to have some authority. And there are many nations who do team up with him early on, including Jerusalem. Um, they'll, actually, they'll actually come and make an alliance with Rome early on, as we'll talk about in a moment, uh, and acknowledge Caesar. And Caesar will give them a lot of, of breath because of that and a lot of freedoms that they wouldn't get otherwise. And to give you an idea of the cult of Caesar and just how much worship of Caesar actually happens. In the province of Judea, where Jerusalem is located, by the time of Jesus, Herod the Great is going to build a giant temple explicitly for the worship of Herod. He'll actually create a town and name it after him called Caesarea. And we've, we read about that in the book of Acts. It's a major port city in Judea. And in that city, the whole idea behind it is this city is made in the honor of the god Caesar. And this whole city has a temple in it. And the biggest temple in the whole place is there for the worship of Caesar as a god. So he's raising up a god his ancestors didn't know and, and putting himself in that kind of position. So let's continue on. And now we're going to hear more about the military conquests of Caesar during that time. And again, we'll see some historical events that line up with this. Uh, so now verses 40 through 45. At the time of the end, the king of the south will engage him in battle, and the king of the north will storm out against him with chariots and cavalry and a great fleet of ships. He'll invade many countries and sweep through them like a flood. He will invade the beautiful land. Many countries will fall, but Edom, Moab, and the leaders of Ammon will be delivered from his hand. He will extend his power 
over many countries. Egypt will not escape. He will gain control of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt with the Libyans and the Cushites in submission. But reports from the east and the north will alarm him, and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. He will pitch his royal tent between the seas at the uh, between the mountain the holy mountain between the seas at the whole, the beautiful holy mountain excuse me yet he will come to his end and no one will help him so here we're seeing more characteristics of, of uh, who Julius Caesar will be and one of those characteristics we see is that Caesar is going to go and eventually early on in his life when he's when he's conquering he'll go and attack the Ptolemaic Empire in the south that's that last residual empire of the Greeks that's still there in the area of Egypt. And we see historically Caesar does exactly that. Early in his reign, that's one of his big targets. He goes down there and goes to war with them. On the way, he actually uh, creates an alliance with the people of Israel with a man named Hyrcanus. And he also creates alliances with nations like Ammon and modern-day Jordan that you see listed there. And so a lot of those people see him and they think, boy, you're a whole lot better than those people south of us were when they conquered us. So we'll make a deal with you. And in fact, Caesar will go and he'll punch down into the Ptolemaic Empire in Egypt. He'll win some sweeping military victories, but at one point he'll be close to being undone and it'll be troops from those very areas, from Jerusalem itself, coming in and backing him up that'll actually bail him out of the fire and rescue him uh, during a tight part of that military campaign. Now, as he's on the verge of conquering Egypt and doing one of his big lifelong goals, Egypt has been historically throughout most of world history a big center of power, and here he is about to conquer it. He's then going to hear that in the northeast there is a, an insurrection happening and people he's already conquered are starting to rebel against him. Um, and so you see that in verse 44 being reported, but reports from the east and the north will alarm him and he will set out in a great rage to destroy and annihilate many. To say historically that Caesar was furious about this is an understatement. Here he is on the eve of accomplishing a life goal that he's killed tens and thousands of men from the enemy forces and his own to take. He's about to conquer all of Egypt. And on the eve of that, now in the northern, northeastern part of Rome, there's a rebellion happening. And so he takes his armies and in a fury he goes up there to put down the rebellion. And in fact, it's during this very war that Caesar utters his famous lines, his Vene Vidi Vice, I came, I saw, I conquered. He says that once he's actually destroyed those northern forces. It's his, his words of satisfaction of like, you guys tried to stop me from having my will with Egypt, but now you see what happens when you mess with Rome. And so uh, they have this, this penalty that comes out of that. So all these things describe him well in his military campaigns. Uh, he does camp his forces near Jerusalem between them and the Mediterranean. Verse 45 indicates that. He'll, he'll use that as a station during these wars to rally his troops at. So historically we see that. Um, and that final verse is interesting because it speaks about his death. Yet he will come to his end and no one will help him. Well, if you recall your history, the death of Julius Caesar... Uh, in the Roman Senate, they decide they don't really like having a dictator anymore, and so they all sharpen their knives, team up, and even his friends, such as Brutus, come in and stab him to death on the Senate floor, and, and there he dies. Nobody comes in to rescue him. You see in the historical narrative of that, nobody's rushing in like, wait, 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 we can't let this happen to Caesar. Everybody just decides they're getting rid of him. Now, what happens subsequent to that, Caesar dies, Julius Caesar dies, and then uh, we have uh, Mark Anthony, who was another prominent leader in the Roman Empire, uh, who has sort of a love tri triangle going on with he and Cleopatra and Caesar and Cleopatra. Um, so, and this is Cleopatra the third, not the first who we talked about last week. So Mark Anthony, he tries to take over the throne. And at the same time, the great nephew of Julius Caesar, who Julius Caesar had selected, he didn't have his own uh, child to take the throne, but he selected his great nephew, Octavius Caesar, to take over his throne. Octavius begins a war that happens, in effect, a civil war for a season happens in the Roman Empire. But ultimately, Octavius wins that out. And once he does, he calls himself the, you know, the great exalted Caesar or Augustus Caesar. He takes this higher title of Caesar. And Augustus Caesar, or Octavius, he will actually continue to rule from this time forward, from the death of Julius, onward to the coming of Jesus. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, I believe it's chapter 2, you'll read that he'll say, in the days of Caesar Augustus, you know, that Jesus was born. He actually lists that out as an event. It's during his reign that this happened. So we have gone 
clear from the year 540 or so when this prophecy is happening for Daniel and God has now laid out all of history through the Roman Empire leading up to the coming of Christ. We've seen all the events that will happen being laid out uh, in this final chapter or this near, next to final chapter of the book of Daniel. Now chapter 12, we're going to start to hear, we'll hear a little more prophetic details, but we're also going to hear what is Daniel supposed to do with all this? And we're going to really round out all this. It's only 13 verses, but there's some important things that happen there. So let's Let's move forward with that, uh, and we'll begin uh, that with uh, verses 1 through 4. Chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. At that time, Michael, the great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Many will go here and there to increase in knowledge." Okay, so at the beginning, it points out that, uh, that at that time, Michael, the archangel Michael, who we've seen mentioned before here, Michael historically, as we see denoted here, is a protector of God's people, a protector of Israel. That's one of his roles as an archangel. We frequently see him when he's named. He's only one of three named archangels in the Bible. We see him frequently when he's named having that sort of role of watching out for God's people. It says he's going to be called in, and with that, a time of distress is going to happen that's never happened before. And we're really talking about the time period from, from Jesus' life onward to the destruction of temple. We've got uh, the persecution that happens under Herod the Great, where he actually goes and kills the firstborn of all the, the families in Bethlehem. Uh, we can go through to the insurrections and the rebellions that happen in Jerusalem, where they fight against the Romans and suffer big consequences for that. Uh, we see Jesus' life, his, his death, burial, and resurrection. And with that, his prophecy is about the ultimate collapse of the temple. And when we read chapter 8 of Daniel, it talked about these different beasts that were going to come to represent different empires. And we discussed that that final unnamed beast that represented Rome had ten horns on it that represented ten emperors of the Julian dynasty, of the dynasty coming from Julius Caesar. So this time period we're talking about is going to carry us clear through to the tenth of those, to the emperor Vespasian, and he'll be the one who actually destroys the temple. So we're seeing that warned um, that this is going to happen, and that there's going to be a sorting out of people that happens uh, that happens with that. And so uh, we see there in verse 1 it says, uh, halfway through it, but at that time, your people, everyone whose name is found written in the book, will be delivered. So there's going to be a great deliverance of people who, who, whose name is in the book of life, people who respond to Jesus. And, and he uses a, a metaphor for that. He talks talking about multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake. Um, now, again, if, if people are viewing this as an apocalyptic prophecy, they see this as the raising of the dead, if you're thinking about this as the end of the world. But if we're talking about the era of Caesar, I think the logical explanation is that we're the people who dwell in the dust of the earth. We're just people down here on the earth. And yet, we're going to come awake to the possibility of who the Messiah is. We're going to be faced with that question we're still faced with today of who is Jesus and what do we do with Him. And if we choose to follow Him, we'll find ourselves entering everlasting life. And if we choose to reject Jesus and ignore what's going on with Him, then we'll find ourselves in everlasting destruction. And it's interesting, people talk about the Old Testament not talking about heaven or hell. Here in Daniel, you can see what seems to be a pretty clear mention of it. Here's everlasting, everlasting life or everlasting damnation. You can choose which one you want, um, but, but those are the options. Verse 3 says, those who are wise, those people who follow the gospel, who accept the Christ, um, will shine like the brightness of heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So there's going to be this glorification that happens in heaven, particularly uh, not just for those who come to Jesus, but especially for those who actually tell other people who Jesus is who share the gospel. And it makes you think of the apostles, for example, men like Stephen, who stood out on the steps of the temple and preached the gospel to a bunch of hard-hearted people who didn't want to hear it. In fact, they didn't want to hear it so much. When they got done, they all picked up rocks, threw them at him until he was dead and killed him. And among those men was the apostle Paul, who eventually has his heart softened, who, who testifies in his own lifetime about what he was a part of with Stephen. Uh, and yet God transforms him as in, through sermons like Stephen's, through messages like that and his encounter with Jesus um, on the road to Emmaus, and so, uh, and uh, 
And so here uh, we see all of this laid out and we get the sense of the weight that's going to be there for people who follow uh, Christ or or don't, the the decision and the weight that comes with that decision. But in the end, verse 4, there's instruction. uh, The road to Damascus, I should have said for Paul, not Emmaus, the road to Damascus. Um, Anyway, in verse 4, we see final instruction. We're going to see this repeated a few times to Daniel himself. What's Daniel supposed to do with all this? So verse 4 says, But you, Daniel, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. Now there's that question, what do we mean by the time of the end? Uh, Again, if people are viewing this from an apocalyptic lens, they're going to say, until the end of the earth. But I think we've seen this terminology used before in in, in the book of Daniel, and it seems to be actually a reference to the time of the end of the old covenant, the time of a new era being ushered in under Jesus. So save that, because that time is going to be on the horizon. It's going to be coming. And, And certainly we can see in Daniel's time, He's being told about all these different rulers and all these different events, but he'll be dead before any of this happens. It, these things will, will already have elapsed. And yet, he says uh, in that final part of the verse, many will go here and there to increase knowledge. So the, the, the scrolls that are being copied of the book of Daniel, these, these copies of chapter 11 and the chapters before it are going to be circulated. And people in history moving forward from where Daniel is are going to look around and they're going to say, oh my gosh, this Antiochus guy is, is terrible. Hey, could that be the person we were talking about in Daniel chapter 11? They'll start to actually see what's happening and see that God is testifying to these very historical events and God's Word is going to come to life in a new way as what was promised by God becomes fulfilled and they start to see those pieces coming together and anticipate that the Messiah is going to come. All right, let's continue on with verses 5 through 7. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there before me stood two others, one on this bank of the river, and one on the opposite bank. One of them said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the water of the river, How long will it be before these astonishing things are fulfilled? The man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the river, lifted his right hand and his left hand toward heaven, and I heard him swear by him who lives forever, saying, It will be for a time, times, and half a time, when the power of the holy people uh, has been finally broken, and all these things will be completed. So Daniel, he leaves this vision, and as he leaves the vision, he sees an angel standing next to him, and an angel once again on the far side of the river, who's clothed in linen. It seems to be the same angel that we saw him bring up in Daniel chapter 10, and one of them asks the other this important question, how long will it be before the fulfilling of these things? And it seems like on the surface when you read it, he's actually asking how long from right now, 540-ish BC, till we see all these events completed that you've just talked about. But that is either not the question he's asking or it's not the question that the angel offers an answer to. The angel offers an answer, but it doesn't seem to be that because no matter how we view this passage, we can safely say it didn't happen in three and a half years. Can we agree on that? We didn't have Antiochus there in three and a half years. The end of the earth didn't come in three and a half years. And Julius Caesar didn't happen in three and a half years. So clearly that three and a half year period has another significance. Now, we saw that three and a half year time times and time and a half Um, We saw that same term used in previous chapters referring to the time under Antiochus Epiphanes. We see a similar figure used in the book of Revelation to talk about when the apocalypse comes. But if we're talking about Julius Caesar, this makes some sense because uh, when the Jewish people entered into that final rebellion against uh, the the nation of Rome, then it it took about three and a half years from the time that that the Vespasian came in with the Roman army to the time that the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. It took him three and a half years to militarily destroy Israel. The destruction of the temple itself, that was only a little under five months. But um, those actual events concluded there. So, And notice the net effect. He says, what's going to happen as a result of that? In the latter parts of verse 7, he says that the effect will be when the people, when the power of the holy people has been finally broken and all these things are completed. So the breaking of the power of the holy people, the holy people tends to be Israel, their power is going to be broken. Well, how? Because Jerusalem won't exist anymore. The temple will be torn down. All the sacrificial systems are going to be done away with. If you had any doubts about whether God was done with that old covenant or not and hadn't fulfilled it through Jesus, well, this is, this is a predictor towards that. Now I'll say, we read all this and it's easy to be confused. I have verse 8 as a standalone verse because I think you'll take some comfort from this. Uh, Daniel, having heard this, he says, I heard, but I did not understand. So I asked, 
my Lord, what will the outcome of all this be? It's kind of funny because even Daniel here, as this prophet, so beloved by God, uh, receiving all these prophecies, even he, after hearing all these things, is just like, okay, man, I have no idea what you're talking about. I don't get it. (laughs) What on earth is all this about? And you'd think that he'd get a great explanation, but you'll see here, um, that's not exactly it. Daniel doesn't need to know the answer to this, and and those who come after will have a sense of it. Um, But for Daniel's part, it's, I hope you find some comfort. He was confused about it. I bet some of you were confused about it too. And yet, by the time we're done, I hope hopefully it'll make a little more sense. We have the, the blessing of history to be able to look back and see where these events may have fitted into things that occurred. So the angel's response there is in verses 9 and 10. He replied, Go your way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, made spotless, and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. So in effect, he's telling Daniel, Daniel, you know what? You don't have to get this right now. This prophecy, it isn't, it's being given to you, but it's not actually for you. It's for the people who come after you, for those people who live through the Greek Empire and through the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire and can look and say, okay, that's exactly what Daniel was talking about. And it's fascinating because, again, we often talk about this being the silent period or the intertestamental period where the Old Testament ends, and then we've got several hundred years, about 400 years, from when the Old Testament quits being written to when the New Testament begins and Jesus comes. And we often say that's a silent time period, but actually, it's not actually silent. It's just that God already foretold everything that was going to happen before it occurred. He spells it all out really clearly uh, in in the book of Daniel here to where people in Jesus' day have read it and looked at it like Simeon and Anna who, who bless him in the temple and his birth, they look at it and they say, this has to be the time frame. The Messiah has to be coming soon. They understand God's word well enough to get that. And so it's not here for Daniel. It's here for them. And it, guys, it's here for us too. We can look back and see God called out all these things hundreds of years before any of these historical events happened. God called out what would happen very specifically. And again, you can see even more of that if you look at the, the first part of our chapter 11 message last week. Um, but a lot of vivid details about how things are going to unfold. So now the final section here, um, oh, I, I want to say in, in verse 10 there, he starts to specify, you know, throughout this time, there's going to be good people doing good things and getting God's blessing for it. And there's going to be bad th- people doing bad things, and they're not even going to be able to read this and get it. They're just, it's, it's not that, that they're being stopped from it, but their hearts are just so set against God that even having read Daniel's prophecies and even being able to look and see right there is the guy Daniel's talking about, they're still going to say, I don't believe it. It's all nonsense. Is that true today? Yeah, it's true now, right? I mean, we can look back and see thousands of prophecies filling the Bible that are 100% right 100% of the time. That's kind of crazy. Is there any other book that has this? And yet, there's plenty of people who can hear that evidence. And if we choose to, it's not because the evidence is so bad for the Bible, but if we choose to, we can say, I just don't want to believe in Jesus. I want to keep on in my sin and do whatever I want to. And so I'm going to ignore this. And so we, we can refuse to walk in the light because of what's happened here. And, and miss out on what God is doing. And, and that was the case in Daniel's day. It was the case in Jesus' day. And it's the case in our day. And we're going to see some themes there as we round out our message today. Okay, so verses 11, uh, 11 and 13, we're going to hear about um, the final destruction of Israel and some final words for Daniel. From the time that the daily sacrifice is abolished and the abomination that causes desolation is set up, there will be 1,290 days. Blessed is the one who waits for and reaches the end of 1,335 days. As for you, go your way till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the days, you will rise and receive your allotted inheritance. So, uh, verse 11, we see a phrase we've seen before. They say that there's going to be a ceasing of daily sacrifices and that an abomination that causes desolation is going to be set up. These words were previously used to describe Antiochus Epiphanes and what he would do when he went in and and raided the temple and set up a shrine inside of the temple to worship Zeus or Jupiter uh, and brought in pagan priests and desecrated the whole place, sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple. Uh, So we see Antiochus being described as having done this, and yet here we're talking about a future time where that's going to happen and trying to piece that together. And again, uh, we can find the final Caesar, Vespasian, the emperor of Rome, who comes in and conquers Israel, uh, who will fulfill this. 
Uh, not only, I'll say, this, this conquest of Jerusalem is one of the, the darkest events in history, and this passage says it's going to be that. It's nothing in history is going to be as bad as what happens there. Um, although it will take three and a half years for Rome to enter Israel and conquer the whole nation, the actual destruction of the city of Israel itself will be completed in less than five months. Now, that's pretty astonishing because this was one of the best fortified cities in the ancient world. Huge walls. They had years worth of food. Most historians estimate around a decade worth of food stored up in Israel. That they can just sit in there and they can wait and starve out the Roman army. Wait for them to get bored and go home. And that's the plan. Uh, but there's two, uh, there's three different major leaders that are at play, and I'd love to go into the history of it, but I, I can't. But there's three major leaders at play within Jerusalem. There's factioning between them. And so they actually start fighting with each other. While Rome is trying to destroy them from outside, they start fighting with each other. And within a month's time, you see major granaries filled with grain that are burned to the ground, water sources in the city that are, that are poisoned, where one faction will go and destroy and poison a well that the other faction was trying to use. And so soon enough, everybody in the city is actually starving to death. Even though they had a decade's worth of food and water, it's gone and nobody has anything. Um, Josephus reports, the, the Jewish historian who we'll talk about later, he gives an account of during that siege that things were so bad that there's a story of, of some Pharisees that were traveling around and they were starving. So they were going around in a little mob and they were looking for anybody who had food that they could steal from them. And they smelled, coming from this woman's house, the smell of roasting meat. And they thought, wow, okay, we're going to get that. And they kick down this lady's door and go to steal the food from her. And when they come in, Josephus says, they discover that a newborn child she has, she was roasting to eat. Things got so bad in Jerusalem that literally people were eating their own children. That's how, how far things declined here. And a fascinating historical detail is that Christians, that Jewish Christians at the time, largely left before this all happened because Jesus had prophesied that this would occur. In his lifetime, he said that not one stone will stand upon another in several different points. He, he created this prophecy and, and declared this would happen. So the Jewish Christians have largely left, but the people who were left thought they would thumb their nose and, and take over and, and uh, <clears throat> really um, punch, punch Rome in the face and show them who's in charge. And that's just not what happened. In fact, um, after less than five months, the, uh, the emperor Vespasian conquers Jerusalem. It collapses in on itself. He takes it over. He mass murders people who are inside of there. And he hauls off 700 of them with him to Rome. With them, he also takes uh, the, uh, the candle that was inside the, the inner part of the temple and the showbread that was there. So he takes those two things with him. He parades 700 Jewish slaves and those things with him through Rome. And he actually builds a giant arch in Rome to celebrate his conquest over Israel. Uh, he builds two of them, actually. One of them still stands today. You can go into Rome and see it in the city of Rome. Uh, when he gets into the city of Jerusalem itself before this, he tears down the temple. He tears down the, the city walls, utterly destroys it, um, and marches his troops through it. So he, this abomination that causes desolation. Some people wonder, well, how did what Caesar do qualify as that? Well, for one, he utterly destroyed the temple. But to add to this, after his parade leading these people back through Rome and his mass murder of the people who live there, he then goes and orders that there be a new temple built on the Temple Mount. A temple built for the worship of Zeus or Jupiter, whichever Greek or Roman name you use. Ironically, the same pagan deity that Antiochus put a shrine to in the Holy of Holies, Caesar will order the destruction of the temple and the building of that placed right there where the temple was. It's hard to imagine uh, being, doing something abominable to, temp, to the temple on a higher scale than what actually happens. Uh, and in a minute, we're going to discuss, there's actually some interesting historical events recorded outside of the Bible anticipating what was going to happen here that gave um, the Jewish people who rejected Jesus a, an opportunity to see what was coming and, and understand. But, but we'll see how that goes. They were warned, but they didn't listen. Final verse, verse 13. It says, As for you, go away till the end. You will rest, and then at the end of, of the days, you will rise to receive your allotted inheritance. Basically, for Daniel, God is now saying, you know, they already told you you're retired. I'm telling you you're retired too now. Like you go rest. Daniel's in his 80s at this point. He's lived his entire life in Babylon. Uh, his life is now coming to a close. And God said, hey man, you just go and enjoy your retirement. You're going to die. 
but after you pass away, I'm going to raise you to the promised inheritance that you have. You've been faithful to me. You've listened to me, and I'm going to bless you for that. That's what you need to worry about. You don't need to worry about exactly what every word of this scroll means. There, that's actually for people down the line. Now, it's fascinating because uh, and I want to just dive in briefly into a little bit of other history surrounding this. Uh, the historian Josephus uh, in, his, in his book on the wars of the Jewish people. Josephus lived at the same time as these events were occurring. He recorded them. And again, he has a unique perspective because he was Jewish, but then he also worked for the Roman government as a historian recording these things. He talks about there being eight different signs that God had given the Jewish people prior to the destruction of the temple to warn them about what was going to happen. And so we're going to throw those up on the screen and just talk through them. And I'm going to deep dive on one of them just to show you how deep some of these things actually go. So in the fall of AD 60, uh, AD 62, running through AD 67, so for about a five-year period prior to the invasion uh, of, of, the, of Israel, we see uh, that, and, and actually it continues after that, we see that there was a man named Joshua, the son of Ananias. Now, we don't know if he's related to the Ananias of the book of Acts, which Ananias and Sapphira there who lie about having sold land for God and get punished for it. We don't know if there's any relation there. But, but there's a man who's a peasant farmer by the name of Joshua. And Joshua one day just has the Lord strike him with this conviction that he needs to go out and tell everybody, Jerusalem is doomed, it's going to be destroyed, and so is the temple. And he repeats this message over and over again. And we can find this recorded in a few different places outside of the Bible. And he goes around traveling and saying this. The Jewish people don't respond to it terribly well. So after trying some minor ways of, of correcting his attitude, like beating him or attacking him, uh, or spitting on him. Eventually, they go ahead and grab him and turn him over to the Romans and claim that he's trying to lead an insurrection. The Romans take him, and because he's not a Roman citizen and doesn't have any real rights, they go ahead and lash him. They get a whip out and they lash him. Josephus says they actually lash him so deeply and so badly, but by the time they're done, you can actually see his vertebrae and his, uh, and his ribs poking through. The meat has been ripped away and the bone is actually showing. Somehow he survives that, and then according to witnesses, as he undergoes that, the whole time he doesn't cry out and ask them to stop. He doesn't do anything like that. He just continues to say, Jerusalem is going to fall, and God is going to destroy the temple. Jerusalem is going to fall, and the temple is going to be destroyed. He keeps repeating this over and over again. Eventually the Romans decide, this guy's just a lunatic, and they let him go. They release him. Somehow he survives that, and he goes back to Jerusalem and continues to preach. And according to Josephus, this continues up until the last day of his life during the invasion of of the city of Jerusalem, he's out on the walls of the temple. And would you like to guess what he's saying to everybody? The same thing again. Jerusalem's going to fall. The temple's going to be destroyed. And, and apparently, according to witnesses, the last thing he says in his life is Jerusalem is going to fall, and so am I. And at that moment, a giant stone from a Roman catapult being launched to the city strikes him and ends his life. God had somebody there spreading a message. But you know, people decide whether they want to listen or not. In late A.D. 65 through 67, it was reported, Josephus says, eyewitnesses claimed that there was a star that looked like a sword and a comet that routinely was appearing in the night sky. And to the Jewish people, that would have been taken as an omen of a major change on the horizon and another indicator of God is, is leaving Israel here. He, he's forsaking them at this point and stepping away and allowing judgment to come. Uh, on March 20th of A.D. 66, it's reported that there is a brilliant light that appears. And again, Josephus gives us an, ex an exact date for this. We'll see a few other events on this exact date. Uh, Josephus says, uh, Jewish priests at the temple report, there's a brilliant light that appears on the altar where the sacrifices are made, and also that appeal, uh, appears in the sanctuary of the temple, in that innermost part of the temple. It's, it's appearing out of nothing. There's just a bright light that appears there. So let's jump to the next thing. Um, on March 20th of AD 66, we see that the doors of the eastern gate of the temple open on their own. So that same night, the doors of the eastern gate of the temple open on their own. Now, to me, I read that from the writings of Josephus, but then I wondered, well, what's the significance of the eastern gate? Is there some significance there? Why the eastern gate? Why wasn't it the northern gate? Um, and so I looked into that. Well, first of all, that eastern gate is the gate that has the most direct access to the temple. If you were trying to walk directly into the temple, directly into the Holy of Holies, that's the most direct route that you could do it. It's also known as the Golden Gate. It's the oldest gate in the temple. In fact, even when the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians, it was said 
that the piers to this gate, which were put in place under Solomon's instruction, King Solomon's instruction, clear back in the 900s BC before Jesus, that those same piers actually stood afterwards and were holding the gates at this time. And so uh, we, we have that gateway still there. It's got this big amount of history that comes with it. In Ezekiel chapter 10, we see these same gates mentioned though. In Ezekiel chapter 10, and Ezekiel's a prophet living during the same time as Daniel, uh, and, and overlapping. He's actually warning the people about what's going to happen early on in his ministry. Ezekiel gives this prophetic vision in Ezekiel 10 saying, God has seen the sin of the nation of Israel and he's not going to put up with it. He's told them Babylon is coming and they're going to destroy you. And he actually gives this vivid imagery of God's presence coming and leaving the temple. God is leaving Israel behind because of their sin against him. And would you like to guess what gate he exits through? The eastern gate. That's where he goes. In fact, in Ezekiel 43, when it talks about God's eventual return and prophetically says, someday in the days of Nehemiah, someday the temple will be rebuilt and God's presence will come back and God's people will have access to him again. But when that happens, again, God returns and he returns through the eastern gate. He comes back again. In Ezekiel 44 and Zechariah 9.9, they've talked about how the doors of the temple won't be opened again until a certain person shows up the Messiah. And they talk about the triumphal entry. They even spell out details like he'll ride into town on an unwritten colt on on the foal of a donkey. And so they're giving these details about Jesus and what he'll do in the triumphal entry. And in fact, when Jesus comes in, you may recall from the triumphal entry, when he comes into Jerusalem during that last week of his life, coming in with people worshiping him, yelling to him, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to the son of David. The Pharisees come up to Jesus and his followers and they indict them and say, what are you doing? He can't do this. People are going to think he's the Messiah. Yeah. Yeah. They might think that. <laughs> there might be a reason for that. And Jesus basically and his disciples say, yeah, um, of course they would. <laughs> um, and if they don't, if they don't worship me, then the rocks will cry out. Like this is, this is the nature of things. And in fact, when we read about that, you can read in Luke 19 about the triumphal entry, but in the latter part of Luke 19, in Luke 19 verses 41 through 44, we can read that actually after Jesus comes in in the triumphal entry, he pauses in these gates of the temple. He pauses overlooking the city of Israel, overlooking the temple here, and he stops and he has this monologue where he talks about and he laments for the nation of Israel. If only you had known who was standing in your midst this day. But because you don't recognize the Messiah, because you don't see me for who I am, well, because of that, this place is going to be destroyed. This whole temple is going to be torn down. He says not one brick will stand upon another. He's talking about the destruction of the temple that will happen in A.D. Uh, in AD 70. And he's doing all of this in, during fulfilling a prophecy about about the Messiah coming into the temple. Jesus, that whole last week of his life, when he enters and he exits, it's that temple gate that he's going through. So again, this eastern gate is a big part of his life. Uh, and here we're hearing, before the destruction of the temple, those gates spontaneously pop open. That's a little weird, isn't it? Fun little tidbit. After, uh, as, after Islamic peoples come and conquer that territory uh, and, and ultimately take it over, the eastern gate is one of the few areas that still stands after all that happens. And actually, uh, Muslims as a result barred that gate shut and they put a cemetery outside of it because they were worried that the Jewish Messiah would come through it. They, they missed the fact that he already came. But they were worried that he would come back and they didn't want this Jewish Messiah returning again and having this power. And they figured if we put a graveyard outside of it, that's an unclean place and no devout Jewish rabbi would ever walk through a spot like that. So this will lock him out. He'll never make it through. They, they missed the fact that he, he already did make it through. But anyway, uh, let's continue on. Now you can see here, if you deep dive into just one of these things, you can see a lot of meaning in it that's fascinating. Um, on May 2nd of AD 66, uh, there, there were a multitude of witnesses who reported seeing chariots and armies, uh, and like a vision of them in the sky at night above the nation of, Jude of Judea, above this, this state. And so they're seeing this again as a warning sign that these nations are going to be coming in. On May 16th of AD 66, according to Josephus, there is a voice that the priests in the temple here coming from the inner court saying, we are leaving here. Maybe that's a sign. Um, you might wonder why we. Uh, God often refers to himself in the plural tense because of the Trinity, because he's three in one, uh, and yet he's one God. And you can go look at our Creed sermon series from this summer if you want to know the dynamics of that. Uh, but we see that, for example, in Genesis, that's one of the first examples where God says, let us make man in our image. Uh, well, why does God use plural tense? Because because he's triune in nature. And so here again, God is saying in his triune nature, we're leaving here. 
we're gone. You guys can stay behind, but I'm not. I'm not going to be here for what happens next. Um, in September, final warning signs, in September of AD 66, General Cestus invades Judea, a preliminary invasion by this Roman general. He's unsuccessful in his efforts, and to many of the Jewish people, they take this as a sign of, good, now Rome knows. Don't screw with Israel or we'll mess you up. Really, this is a final warning sign to the Jewish people. God's prophesied this. Jesus has said it's going to happen. Daniel said it's going to happen. God warned you about this. Are you ready for it, though? And in the year 67, the spring of AD 67, uh, as we said before, Vespasian invades, uh, conquers the land, and in the final five months, or a little less than five months of that time period, uh, Jerusalem falls, the temple is destroyed, and all of those prophecies laid out by Jesus, all those warnings given by Him are fulfilled. So what do we do with all this? in our life. How do we apply this? I want to suggest to you, there's a funny rhythm that we see in all of this. It's fascinating to me that in the days of Daniel, in the days of Ezekiel, warnings are going forward to people all across the world. God is unhappy with how you're living, how you're behaving. He wants you to change the way you're doing it. And here's your warning. Wrath is coming if you don't do it. And yet, by and large, as we saw, people ignored. Daniel listened Daniel listened. He was different. He and his friends, Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael, they chose a different route. And because of that, they actually changed the trajectory of the nation they were in. They actually came and had interactions steering the course of world history. And all that happened because unlike everybody else around them in a culture that was hostile towards God, including their own culture, let alone the Babylonian culture, they said, you know, they may not believe all this. They may reject all the promises of Scripture, but I am going to trust in them. I'm going to make that first. And, and that same thing, it happens again in Jesus' day. Jesus comes down as this prophecy has told us in Daniel chapter 12, and He gives us opportunity. I'm the Christ. I'm the Messiah. Follow me or don't follow me, but live or die based on the decision that you made. And a lot of people walked away and said, eh, that wasn't the Messiah I wanted. I wanted somebody who's a military leader. I wanted somebody who, who was cooler than that. We're not going to use that guy. Despite the evidence, they ignored it. And here today, here we are awaiting another coming of Jesus, awaiting a fulfillment of other prophecies in the Bible, or some might argue the ones we just read. And the same decision faces us today. Do you want the approval of your culture? Do you want the approval of the world? Do you want the easy way forward? Or do you want to make a decision to heed the warnings of Scripture and follow Jesus all in? If you choose to do the latter, there's no telling how this world might be changed. Not just this world, your families, your community, but this country as a whole. It can pivot when people put their feet in the ground and say, I don't care what the people around me say. I don't care what their hearts are for. I am going to love Jesus and I'm going to follow Him. That's what my heart's for. That's what I'm going to do. When we do that, things become different. And yet, we still face that decision. And folks, let me tell you, if you think this culture is hostile to Christianity now, don't hold your breath waiting for it to get better. The trends are heading the opposite direction. So you're going to have to be stronger tomorrow than you are today to be able to make those stands. Are you going to get sucked into the ways of this world and the patterns of it and the sins of it and live for that? Live in a lukewarm sense for God or not at all for God? Or are you going to be all out for Him? And that's the decision that your life rises and falls on, that mine rises and falls on, and that in fact the future of this community and this nation rise and fall on. If more people will take that stand like Daniel did, then the trajectory of things can change. God is, is looking out across the land, wondering, is there anybody here who actually is going to listen to me, who's actually going to have the faithfulness to quit letting their own self-interests, get to stop letting their self-interests get in the way of what God wants to do through you for His kingdom. We have the warning, but will we yield to it? Our lives will be different if we do. At this point, I'm going to ask our uh, leaders to come forward for our communion and offering meditations. Amy's going to lead us in a closing song. As they do, I'll ask you to join me for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. Thank you for this chance to take this journey through Daniel. We see in him a person of character and courage uh, that is humbling. Lord, we haven't done a fraction of what he has. And yet, Lord, we know you will do so much more if we turn our hearts to you. I pray today that we would make the decision to heed the warning of Scripture, 
to know that You are real, that You are truthful, and when You say to us that coming to You means life and walking from You means death, that we would cling to the life You offer and have lives that are transformed and communities and families and a country that are transformed as a result of that. We thank You and we ask these things in Your Son Jesus Christ's name, Lord. Amen.